I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, A Living Memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's very timely program on the history of American Jewish summer camping. Coming just as some of you have just dropped off your kids or grandkids at summer camp for the season, or perhaps as some of you are spending the summer uh, fondly remembering your own camp experiences from many years ago, we're glad you're here. It's not just a topic that's fun and timely, but also one of real enduring relevance for the American Jewish community as we think about how to sustain Jewish identity across generations. We're lucky to have two very distinguished guests with us this evening to explore the topic. Rabbi Rick Jacobs is president of the Union for Reform Judaism, which leads the largest and most diverse Jewish movement in North America with more than 1.5 million people and 15 overnight camps. Before his tenure at URJ, Rick spent 20 years as a visionary spiritual leader at Westchester Reform Temple in Scarsdale and served as the rabbi of the Brooklyn Heights Synagogue. Rick has studied for two decades at Jerusalem's Shalom Hartman Institute, where he's a senior rabbinic fellow. We're also welcoming Dr. Gary P. Zola, the executive director of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives and the Edward M. Ackerman Family Distinguished Professor of the American Jewish Experience and Reformed Jewish History at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati, Ohio. A, a title that is just as prestigious as it is long. <laughs> Gary edits the Marcus Center's award-winning semi-annual periodical, The American Jewish Archives Journal. In 2006, he co-edited a collection of essays on the history of Reformed Jewish camping titled, A Place of Our Own, The Rise of Reformed Jewish Camping which you can find at the link in the Zoom chat. We were hoping to be joined this evening by Dr. Jenna Weissman Jocelyn, who's a terrific scholar with real expertise on Jewish summer camping, but she was unable to join us due to a family emergency. As Rick and Gary explore the history of Jewish summer camps over the next hour, please feel free to share your questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. Since there are so many Jewish summer camps in the United States, please try to keep your questions focused on the general topic at hand rather than on the history of a specific camp. We are recording this evening's conversation and we'll send out the link tomorrow as well as making it available on the museum's website. Without further ado, a warm welcome to both of you, Rick and Gary, feel free to get started. Thank you, Ari. And it's a pleasure to be with my colleague, Rabbi Dr. Gary Zola, who is just an inspiration, one of the most brilliant American Jewish historians that we have and someone who is himself a partisan of Jewish summer camping. And uh, it's a treat to be with you, Gary, and all these nice people who on this uh, wonderful summer day have said this is where they want to be. I'm gonna guess that almost everyone who wants to be on this webinar is here because there is a personal connection. And we're seeing an unbelievable litany of I think almost every Jewish overnight camp in North America, and some of them multiple times. But I also think you have on this webinar in our audience, people who are part of multi-generation families connection to a summer camp. And they're across the waterfront of, uh, of camps. So it is really an honor and it's timely because we're not just having this conversation in November or January. We're having this conversation at a moment when our camps, thank goodness, are once again filled with the joyful sounds of, of kids learning and celebrating and having fun and being Jewish in the most natural and transformational ways. I would just say, personally, I would not be here as a rabbi if it were not for my experience as a camper and a staff member at uh, our reform movement's camp in Northern California, which back in the day was called Camp Swig. Today, it's Camp Newman. And I'm just gonna, one personal story. I remember my mom signed me up when I was uh, nine to go to Camp Swig, and I was so upset. I said to my mom, why did you sign me up for Jewish summer camp? I, I said, I don't wanna to go to Hebrew school in the summer. And I imagined that we got to camp, they were gonna sit us in desks in classrooms with chalkboards, and we would have like, you know, basically a, a hot version of Hebrew school. Well, it turned out that my mom was right about everything, and she sure was right to sign me up because it was one of the most engaging and inspirational experiences of my life. And I know today we're gonna have a chance not just to talk personally, but to zoom out and think about what is this incredible 
uh, institution of Jewish overnight camps, which has frankly been something that has really shaped American Jewish life. It's, it's shaped a whole generation of leaders. And um, at this very moment, it's doing its very magic. I wanna say that uh, just, we'll talk about it maybe a little later, but uh, after COVID, there has never been a more challenging summer to open camp, no matter where you are. But our remarkable staffs across all the different camps are doing it. They're doing it safely. They're doing it brilliantly. And uh, really, we must just say not only thank you, but kola kavod uh, to all those who have been working overtime to bring the magic back. But Rabbi Gary, Do Do Rabbi Dr. Gary Zola, I mean, to me, that's a mouthful, but you've earned each of those titles. Rabbi Zola, can you talk, give us, give us a historian's take on this, not, not our personal take, but can you tell us where do they come from? Why do they matter? And just give us a perspective that only you have. Well, I'd be happy to do that. Before I do that, you know, we, we both got very lavish introductions, uh, Rabbi Jacobs, uh, but the, the most important uh, uh, a fact about our biographies was left out, and I want to make sure we begin that way. Uh, I am honored to be in the same ordination class as Rabbi Jacobs and uh, the, the great class of 1982. So, uh, uh, you know, and there I always say to Rabbi Jacobs, there has to be someone at the top of the class, which is Rabbi Jacobs, who's leading our reform movement. And, uh, and uh, as always, Zola's at the bottom, but nevertheless, it's great to be here with you. And uh, I love your story. I'm gonna, uh, I, I, I'm gonna resist the urge to tell a similar story about myself and just you know, uh, respond to your question, because it is important. Uh, I, I wanna say that uh, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, sociologists from Brandeis uh, uh, really uh, began to study uh, the 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 extent of how reform how uh, Jewish camping has uh, impacted the North American uh, community Jewish community and uh, at that time this is already uh, almost two decades ago uh, they they said that there's nearly 200 bona fide uh, summer camps in in uh, in uh, North America uh, and uh, uh, that serve approximately 80,000 young people every year. Uh, and that doesn't include another 15 or say 18,000 uh, young adults who are college students and so forth who serve in the staff, but are also participants in the program. And uh, I think we all know, and maybe we'll get into this a little later, that the extent of, uh, of uh, Jewish camping and its, its impact on, on Jewish life is is, is really almost defies description. And, and, uh, and, and when you think about its beginnings, uh, I, I, I don't know that we would have imagined this. Uh, just a few points uh, because uh, we, we have to do this quickly, but you know, one of the important points is uh, camping, what we call summer camping or uh, multi-week camping is really an American innovation. It's something that really began in the United States and has been exported all around the world. Believe it or not, camping begins uh, during the Civil War. And I'll, I'll show this if I have time a little later, I have some illuminations of this. It begins during the Civil War and uh, uh, the, the, uh, a, a small, uh, uh, the inspiration of a, a man who uh, by the name of Gunn, uh, uh, Frederick Gunn, who, uh, who believed that uh, he was too old to go to fight. And so he took these young people, they were teenagers, he brought them together uh, to emulate what the Union soldiers were doing. And, uh, and that continued on after the war. And it was from that militaristic beginning where they lived in tents and they cooked their own food and they had discipline. And so it was from that that American camping begins. So by the 1870s, we uh, begin to see a new innovation that, that, that occurs. And that is the idea of building up character and education. Uh, uh, camps uh, are, 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 uh, begin this way and they begin to serve both uh, wealthy clientele and very poor clientele. Uh, people who live in the inner cities and uh, a part of what it was called the fresh air movement. 
And it's at this time in the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, that some Jews begin to acquire camps. They begin to purchase camps and they begin to go into the camping business. But it isn't until the 20th century that uh, uh, what you might call intentionally Jewish camps are begin to take shape. And I'll, I'll spell this out, the, a few of the specific leading names, but uh, uh, these are camps that the Jewish community actually begins to organize, different parts of the Jewish community, and they have different purposes. And then the final two steps come uh, after World War I, or perhaps during World War I and right after. Uh, one is when uh, uh, the idea of actual Jewish education is infused into the camps. And that begins uh, 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 in the teens of the 20th century and followed by uh, a, a whole series of what you might call uh, educational initiatives that take place in camping. And the very last phase is when the religious denominations begin to create their own camps uh, using the this idea of educational camping and the educational experience to actually teach the religious experience from the perspective of the specific denomination. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, the, the first religious denomination to, uh, to create such a, an effort was uh, uh, the conservative movement, which uh, Camp Ramah uh, began about five or six years before the reform movement began its camping program. So that's the overview. In other words, to summarize uh, uh, Rabbi Jacobs, what you really have is an American institution. And as I always teach in my classes, if it's American, it's going to be American Jewish. And so out of, out of this American institution, some of the themes that were a part of the uh, a camping movement of America begin to inspire first people to own camps, and to run camps, then Jewish institutions begin to take on the camping idea. And then you begin with the educational initiatives for various ideas, Zionism, Hebrew, and so forth. And finally, uh, you end up with the denominational camps and the impact that this entire apparatus has had on our Jewish community. I think many people would say it's one of the greatest uh, innovations of American Jewry. And it has been, just like American camping has been exported around the world, so too has Jewish camping been uh, exported around the world. We, we have similar, what you call American Jewish style camping all over the globe today. Great, very helpful. And I think you already helped us to know some of the diversity of these camps. You know, you talk about the denominational camps. Then there's a whole group that are really Zionist in their uh, organization and in their uh, program. You also have um, the JCC and the Federation, the community, as you described. We also have private camps, uh, private Jewish camps. And I, you know, I think of one, I'm doing a wedding next weekend, and the, the groom told me that every one of his groomsmen, he met at one of these private Jewish camps where 80% of the campers were Jewish, and the only Jewish practice was that the Friday night candles were kindled no services, no educational program, but the bond of creating a Jewish community that has now been decades for this group, this cohort, it's had also a very powerful impact. So are we missing any one of the buckets of the different types of camps that we just make sure we got the, the waterfront identified? Yeah, no, I don't think so. The, in terms of the camps you were just describing, I typically categorize them in two, in two uh, sort of pockets. Uh, meaning you have camps in which the clientele and the owner are Jewish and identifiably Jewish, and uh, therefore they are viewed as Jewish camps. Uh, very often these are for places where you have a high uh, demography of Jews, and the assumption is that everybody who goes is Jewish, but you really don't have anything else other than everyone seems to come from a Jewish home and or a Jewish background. The second division is, like you say, where the, there's no specific uh, educational program, but uh, there may be uh, one or two 
rituals that are performed during the course of the summer. You know, typically, as you said, it's lighting candles on Friday night. Uh, maybe even, I, I remember, for example, uh, 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 before I began to go to the reform camp, uh, 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 on Friday night, we sang not the Motsi at this Jewish camp, the, the first one I went to, but we sang, the Lord is good to me. And so I thank the Lord for giving me the apple tree, the sun, the rain, and whatever it is. Uh, and that, that was that was not that wasn't the motzi, but we said that in a sort of a prayerful way. And so there are those two notions in a sense. And these were the first camps in a way. These were people uh, who bought camps, who got into the camping business, and who wanted to eat, you know, to create. It was it was only after a few decades that you begin to get into the uh, purposeful mission of the camp for, for the Jewish community. Beautiful. And we're seeing lots of great comments as well as a few questions mixed in in the chat. But of course, you know, we have Yiddish speaking, we have socialist, we have the entire, you know, diversity of our Jewish community reflected in their own camps. And some of them have been going strong for a century. Uh, some, you know, were strong and are less so today. Uh, and yes, Orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionists, um, and all of the different stripes when we talk about denominational, it's, it's across everything. You know, it's, it's very interesting uh, what you just said, uh, Rabbi Jacobs, uh, our colleague uh, uh, from Brandeis University, uh, uh, Professor Jonathan Krasner has written on this in his very fine book on uh, Samson Benderley. Why is it that some of the camps have not been able to continue on, whereas some have lasted for a hundred years or more. And he he argues that, uh, and and it's it's worth thinking about. I I, I don't want to say I'm persuaded completely, but it, he he argues that the camps that have not continued to upgrade their facilities to offer the kind of quality that camping needs to offer, just like classrooms and schools have to continue to improve and provide the kind of high level uh, uh, facilities that those camps uh, that were, you know, really run down and rustic lost their luster and people then began uh, 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 to, uh, you know, not want to go to those camps and, and go to uh, higher end camps and, and that the Jewish camping movement has followed in that footsteps. I, I know, for example, uh, I, I mean, being uh, uh, someone who went to a, one of our camps in the reform movement, I can say without question that the, the level of the facilities has grown over the years remarkably and, uh, and, uh, and so have the programs. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I love also that people are just basically putting things on our to discuss list, so we'll keep them there. Okay. Uh, Rabbi Zola, you are obviously the director of the amazing American Jewish Archives. I would love for you, can you share some of the, the riches of the archives in terms of Jewish summer camping? Would really help maybe give a face to some of what we're talking about? Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm delighted to do so, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to share a few. And one of the one of the amazing things that uh, I hope everyone can, can you see uh, my, my starting slide? Great. Uh, the one thing I, I do want to say, because, you know, I'm sure this is uh, everyone who is on this uh, massive uh, webinar, uh, there's no way, friends, that I or Rabbi Jacobs can mention every single camp. Uh, and I'm about to show some documents. Uh, uh, no archives has uh, uh, records of every single camp. And so, uh, but I do want to stress that the American Jewish Archives, even though it has its strength in, uh, uh, in uh, preserving uh, the records of, of the liberal Jewish community, we have uh, uh, many, many records from uh, beyond. And I'm gonna begin by showing you that. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Mr. Gunn, uh, Frederick Gunn, and this is a rare picture from the Library of Congress uh, of, uh, of, of his campers in the year 1861 uh, on the green in Washington, D.C., where he marched them to. And uh, you, you see that there was even a girl, uh, if you look all the way to your left, uh, uh, as a part of, of, of that group. And that, this man is considered by the American Camping Association to be the founder of American camping because of this initiative. 
uh, here's a sketching of, uh, of, of, of uh, we don't have any pictures of it, a sketching of Camp Chokorua. Chokorua was uh, started by Ernest Balst in 1881. And uh, he was a Dartmouth student and a very religious Episcopal who uh, had the idea of building up character for people who would uh, waste away their summers, uh, uh, sitting in their houses and so forth. And uh, he's often credited with providing camping with this idea of spiritual mission, of, uh, of making people better by being at camp together in community. Um, uh, when I mentioned earlier that, uh, that uh, Jews began to acquire camps, here's a great example of it. Rabbi Bernard Ehrenreich, there's several articles on this man, Rabbi Jacobs, and uh, Rabbi uh, Ehrenreich is a graduate of the Jewish Theological Seminary, and he purchased the camp uh, ultimately in Canada. It's a very famous camp and uh, uh, fits that bill you were just describing. It doesn't necessarily have what you would call a Jewish program, but my, many, if not most of the campers have been Jewish and there's a certain Jewish flavor to it. And uh, here's uh, 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 it, the name of that camp uh, that he started is Camp Kawaga. And this is their bulletin. You can see a little picture of what they used to call the dock. That's Aaron Reich on the, on the mantle. And uh, listen, uh, on, on the mantle is one of his famous sayings, uh, uh, Dr. Rabbi uh, Aaron Reich, as God gave us the fire, so gave he us the warmth of friendship. Uh, uh, Aaron Reich was famous also for, for uh, uh, saying he knew how to define God. G-O-D, the great outdoors. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, when, I, when, uh, when, when I said that Jewish institutions begin to uh, take root and, uh, and start their own camps, one of the oldest camps in America, uh, Jewish camps is Surprise Lake Camp, which still is going on to this day. It was established by the Educational Alliance. Its purpose was to reach out to the immigrants who were sitting in the inner cities and, and so forth. And that camp has had a distinguished history. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't have time to go into it, but the whole idea of Native American culture and camps was very, very important in terms of building character. And believe it or not, before we Judaized our camps, uh, many of our camps uh, uh, had this, what we would call Native American culture. And here is Surprise Lake Camp, an Indian pageant from the 1930s. Uh, these were uh, Jewish Native Americans, I guess. So uh, you mentioned, and it's very important. Now we, these documents that I'm showing you right now, we have at the American Jewish Archives. And I, I must say, I don't know if she's listening, if she's in the crowd, but uh, a, a woman who wrote an outstanding volume on the Yiddish camps and on the uh, Yiddish culture in America, Fredel Friedenreich, uh, uh, after she published her book, and I commend it to everyone, she gave a whole co collection of her materials to the American Jewish Archives. So if you're looking for materials on uh, Camp Boyberich or Camp Kinderland or, or, uh, or some of the socialist camps, uh, we have that material. Uh, so you see it here, you know, Far the Kinder, uh, uh, Camp Boyberich. And here is a rare picture from her collection that's at the American Jewish Archives of Camp Boyberich in its very early years. Um, and, and here's uh, a, a, another picture that came from uh, Fradel's collection, Camp Kinderland. Uh, Kinderland uh, was a socialist camp uh, and uh, still exists today. It, it, uh, uh, it was run, run by the Arbiter Ring. Uh, and uh, today it's a, uh, it still exists, but not as a Jewish camp, but as a, uh, a, a, a multicultural camp. Uh, uh, here is the Workman Circle Camp, a, a, a very, uh, uh, they, they, they wrote on the picture, impressive flagpole ceremony from the Workman Circle Camp. They, you would begin with flag, flag raising which is, I remember as a camper, I don't know about you, Rabbi Jacobs, we used to begin with uh, the flag raising. And then you have this, this is often viewed as the first 
educational camping experience, the Sedgwin Camp in Port Jervis. Sedgwin Camps, I saw some people were indicating they grew up at the Sedgwin Camps, that's great. Sedgwin Camps uh, were started in New York, it was uh, out of the Central Jewish Agency uh, uh, in, in New York, which was uh, aimed at uh, educational purposes, to strengthen educational purposes and created a camp in 1919, which ran until I believe the uh, 80s or 90s, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that camp is often viewed as the first attempt to actually teach about Judaism in the uh, new, uh, uh, what you call the, uh, uh, in, in a creative and experiential educational mode. And uh, uh, we talked about uh, some of the specialty camps. Uh, uh, Samson Benderly, the great Jewish educator, started Camp Achva in uh, 1927, which was a Hebrew speaking camp and a Zionist camp. And there were so many of those. I know some of the people are gonna want me to talk about Camp Modine and so forth. Uh, here, here's a photo uh, of a, a baseball game uh, with, you can see in the background, they've got it all. Kadur Basis, they've got all the Hebrew spelled out in, in the background. And uh, 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 finally, we get to the denominational camps. And uh, this is a picture from the first summer of uh, Camp Ramah in Conover, Wisconsin. And uh, there's a whole history of Ramah, thank God, there's a volume on it and uh, I could talk about it, but I know we're, we're short of time. So I'm just gonna finish up with, of course, uh, the crowd will forgive me, how could we have the president of the uh, Union for Reform Judaism here? I, I have to talk about the reform movement's camps. Uh, the uh, first camp uh, established in 1952 was uh, uh, in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And here I am showing you Rick, something I don't know if you've ever seen because it's not only photos that are important, it's documents. You're looking at a picture that Rabbi, your predecessor, Rabbi Eisendrath wrote to Johann Ackerman. Ackerman was a Chicago lay person. He was a manufacturer of auto parts and he was very active in the Chicago region and he was key lay leader to establishing the camp with the Chicago rabbis. And once the, the Chicago rabbis had purchased the camp, there was a deal that was worked out and the union became the owner of the camp. And I'm just gonna blow up for the, for the audience uh, this one paragraph that Rabbi uh, uh, Isadrath writes, that's so moving to me. He says, I cannot tell you what a tremendous thrill I received when I read your letter and I held in my hand the actual certificate of ownership in the first union institute of the UAHC ever to be officially and actually established. And then I go to the second paragraph, Rick, because it says, this is indeed a historic document which is going to be photostatted and forward to the American Jewish archives. So uh, this is how we are connected. Uh, uh, this is the famous ark that the first campers built uh, at that camp. And uh, this is from one of the early brochures. You can see that we play, you see the canoe and uh, one of the buildings in the background, uh, people reading Torah. These are all from early brochures advertising the camp. I said earlier, uh, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi uh, came to the camp. There he is. We have documentary evidence. That's from our collection in Cincinnati. And he spoke to the campers. He was still wearing his Hasidic garb in those days. And of course, we could talk about, uh, and we'll probably talk about the tremendous impact that camping music, camping prayer has had on our entire uh, religious life around the world. And Debbie Friedman, of course, uh, launched that uh, from our camp in Wisconsin. Uh, the last few things I'll show, I'm almost done, is uh, you mentioned, uh, Rabbi Jacobs, you uh, were the head of uh, the Hebrew speaking program at the second camp in uh, Camp Swig in, in uh, California, in Saratoga. And, uh, and uh, this is a, a newspaper from 1968. You People can see it says, Kol HaHechalutz, the voice of the pioneer camp. This was the Hebrew speaking camp in Wisconsin at the uh, at Union Institute. In 1968, Rabbi Jacobs is when Gary Zola was a Halutzim member. 
And this is from the Eton. If you look down at the bottom, those of you who read Hebrew, you'll see it says Gershon. And since we were in Israel together, uh, Rabbi Jacobs knows that's my Hebrew name, Gershon. And uh, this is the 10 commandments for the Madri and for the camper. Uh, and and uh, it's, you can see my humor, which falls flat in the Hebrew, but uh, one day I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, probably do a shiur on that, a lesson on that. The last two things I wanna show you is that uh, this is a picture that means a lot. I'm gonna ask Rabbi Jacobs to talk about this picture right now. Well, oh, it's, a, it's a amazing moment. That's actually this summer at Camp Swig when Avital Sharansky, she was on the cover of Time Magazine. Her husband, Natan, was in prison in the Soviet Union, and she came to our camp. And I had just come back from my junior year uh, at Hebrew University, and she was going to speak in English. She got up in front of 500 campers and staff and all kinds of uh, journalists, and she began speaking in Hebrew. And the director of the camp motioned to me, like, get up there, Jacobs, and start translating. And to be honest, um, you know, the Hebrew was, was, was not hard to translate. The emotion was impossible. This woman said her first words were, my husband is in prison because he can't do what all of you can do today and tomorrow here at camp, speak Hebrew and freely practice your Judaism. Uh, I, I tell you that because, you know, it, it's one of those moments that really helped to shape me, but it shaped all those. I know I saw in the list that uh, Peretz will present who's here, all of us who remember that it was one of those shaping experiences. So I, I must say to, to you, uh, Dr. Zola, thank you for this incredible history lesson. Can we, can we dig down in a couple of key areas? You've uh, given us, I think, some of the the wonderful framing. I know that some of the questions have been, what has been the impact of Jewish summer camping on Jewish life? And I wanna, you showed the picture of Debbie Friedman. I have a, a, a deep belief, I think many of us, if not all of us, that our experiences at camp reshaped the Jewish community. It reshaped prayer, it reshaped Jewish learning. The idea that informal learning was experiential. It was uh, both delightful and impactful. Can, can you just help us understand this was not just a summer vacation where we got to sort of, you know, be outside. It also was a way for us to, for some of us, the first time prayer really spoke to us. And we brought those experiences back. And I think our rabbis must have been unhappy when many of us came in and said, this is not what we want. We, we need we need the music and the spirit and the creativity. We also need to go outside and, you know, smell the trees and the beauty of nature. But I, I, I do believe that this experience, including there's one comment from a colleague who said that Dr. Marcus, your mentor and the mentor of all of us who love Jewish life in America, said that the summer camps redeemed Reform Judaism from itself. I don't know if that's an exact quote, but it was put in the chat. Just speak to the impact. And, and again, not just in reform, but in conservative and in orthodox and in the Zionist camps. How did they reshape how we uh, live as Jews? I'm going to do that. I just want to make sure that we took down. Did I take down the, uh, the uh, images? Okay, yes, great. Yes, and we uh, love them. Thank you. My pleasure. So uh, I, I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right that uh, we, we could touch upon a, a series of individual uh, impacts that, uh, that the camping movement has had on our North American community. And it's not just in liberal Judaism, but really across the board because the Hasidim, uh, the, the Hasidic uh, courts have their own camps. And, uh, and also uh, the Reconstructionist movement has started its camping. And so, uh, and, and that, it, and of course, uh, so, so let's just begin to list. We started with uh, Debbie Friedman. Uh, Debbie Friedman, uh, 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 you know, uh, it, it was uh, really uh, uh, Marx. I'm not gonna say she was the very first, but growing out of, and people, by the way, are studying this now, uh, meaning musicologists, growing out of the introduction of folk music into the camping you know, uh, scene, out of that grows uh, what you might call Jewish folk music. And that introduces 
uh, new liturgical tunes uh, that include not just Hebrew, but also English words. And those words will be carried, that music will be carried back to the community during the uh, uh, regular part of the year. And that has its impact. That's number one. Number two is uh, the whole topic of education. Uh, the formality of education, which was borrowed from the public school system uh, into the Jewish Sunday schools and the afternoon schools, suddenly the informality of education, the whole notion of experiential education uh, is translated into the educational experiences back home. Be, uh, in other words, why, why do we have to sit at desks uh, uh, during Sunday school or in the afternoon schools? Why can't we uh, 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 you know, try to recreate the kinds of experiences we had at camp? Number three is liturgy itself. Uh, uh, you know, as, as you know, uh, uh, camps often in the early days eschewed going to the union prayer book or to prayer books and you would pick out four or five of the main prayers and then cabins would literally write their own original prayers and prayers became very personal. And this just built on, on the idea that unless prayer is meaningful, it's not prayerful. And so uh, 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 the, the whole notion of lit liturgy and transformation of liturgy begins to impact uh, the world. And even this, I, I want to stress, I, we may not be able to go into it in depth, but it, it's not just within the reform or in the liberal movements. It, 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 it has its impact uh, beyond that. And finally, uh, the last division I would mention is what you talked about, uh, Rabbi Jacobs, and that is uh, the informality of camp itself uh, affects the whole atmosphere uh, when you're at camp, you become Rabbi Rick, and that uh, and and uh, you you know the, the, there was a time I I can prove this with documents in the 1920s and the 1930s the the rem, the rabbi and the synagogue removed and austere and far away was an inspiration to people. It was a creating an atmosphere that people move people. After camping movement began to have its effect on us, uh, a, a, a much more of an informal atmosphere in general begins to take over the synagogue. And, uh, and uh, uh, that too is uh, transformational. Uh, it, it has insinuated, camping has insinuated itself through the generations finally, because uh, 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 as 16, 17, 18 year old people, they go off to college and before you know it, five, six, seven years later, they're married, they have children, they begin to come into the synagogue and assume young leadership roles. And what is it they call upon to uh, say, how are we gonna get people of my age back into the synagogue and keep them active while well, they call upon their most positive Jewish experience, which was their camping experience. All of these things have completely transformed uh, Jewish life in America. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I love that we also have this notion that's in the chat, a number of questions about social justice, um, cutting edge issues that we're facing as a society, like in the 60s and 70s, were those reflected in camp? And the answer is, of course, I remember when I was a camper, uh, we were told uh, that one afternoon, Cesar Chavez, the head of the uh, farm workers was coming to camp. And I said to my counselor, that is so cool. I didn't know Cesar Chavez was Jewish. My counselor said, Jacobs, you're an idiot. He's not <laughs> Jewish, but he has something very Jewish to teach us. And that was about having justice be in everything that we do, and in, in particular, the way that workers are treated. So I just think, you know, how does camp in many ways help us across all of these different areas address very challenging issues in society, but camp actually found a way probably more easily and naturally to address some of these. Is that well, reflected that, yeah. across? Well, you're, you're touching on something very important. First of all, you're right. There were very often major personalities who, who for some reason knew a rabbi or 
uh, for some reason was was willing to come to camp. But you mentioned Cesar Chavez. I remember when I was a camper, uh, uh, the, the, there was the whole issue of what kinds of grapes we were going to be eating at camp. So it, in other words, it goes beyond just that a, an important person like Elie Wiesel, who, and by the way, Elie Wiesel did come to camps, uh, uh, various camps during the course of his lifetime. It was also, you know, how social action was played out in the camps. But here's something very important that I discovered when we were writing the book on uh, reform Jewish camping. You know, in the 50s and in the 40s, not every uh, one in the reform movement was a Zionist. And uh, what, what we learned in researching the programs of the early re reform camps is that the camps were able to uh, bypass that. Uh, as Zionism uh, in the camps was, uh, uh, and, and then of course of the young state of Israel was uh, very easily done. And, and that's another, uh, in other words, uh, things that, uh, uh, that uh, are young and are free uh, don't necessarily have to carry on the issues. You know, synagogues and their rabbis, they had their approaches to Zionism, but the camps were new. And so uh, 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 introducing the, the young people to the state of Israel, the fledgling state of Israel, the camps played a very important role in that. And then, as you know, before too long, in the 50s already, you begin to have trips to Israel, uh, Nifty and Israel, and then you have the, the, the program of uh, Shlichut, where we bring uh, Israelis to the camp. And, and then uh, there have been programs, of course, where Americans go to Israel and so forth. So all of this, you're right, is, uh, is part of the social, uh, 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 part of that social action realm uh, uh, of the camps. Thank you. I just want one note about the shlichim, the Jewish emissaries. Uh, one of my very honored roles is I serve on the board of the Jewish Agency uh, for Israel. And we have currently 300 uh, shlichim in our camps. There are about 1,300, I believe, spread out at camps all over North America. And amazingly, I remember uh, Natan Sharansky said, Rick, you should say thank you more that we send you these remarkable young people. I said, I, we can't thank you enough. They, they bring a love of Israel, implant it within our youth powerfully. I said, but Natan, you should thank me. He said, why am I thanking you? You, you accept a gift from us? I said, no, because many of those shlichim had their first positive experience in prayer and in Shabbat and in a Judaism that they did not know. And many of them go back to Israel and found their own congregations and bring the freedom and the creativity that they experienced at camp. So I think the shlichim and the mutual strengthening of our communities is something very powerful. You know, in light of all of the anti-Semitism that we so painfully are seeing, there's a question in the, in the chat, particularly for you, our historian, uh, Dr. Zola, the question is, was part of the flourishing of American Jewish summer camps a reaction to not being welcomed at Gentile camps? Was it really also that we wanted perhaps to go to other types of institutions and they were closed to us, like maybe some of the country clubs and other institutions? How much did that factor into the growth and flourishing of this wonderful movement that we're celebrating today? Well, you know, I don't want to say that it, it had no role, but, you know, to tell you the truth, I, I uh, you know, I think that uh, it, it probably uh, uh, was really not, not uh, so prominent uh, uh, because uh, the, 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 the camps that Jews went to in the, in the uh, early part of the 20th century, uh, they were uh, often owned by Jews. Uh, uh, they, these are people who, you know, sometimes, for example, uh, these the camps uh, were initiated for the purpose of helping the Jewish community or helping Jewish citizens. Um, and, and there was also the comfort level. Uh, many times uh, people who would go away to, you know, arts camps or to tennis camps or to sports camps uh, uh, just wanted to be with their own community. Uh, so uh, my studies uh, don't show, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that that was a primary factor. Uh, uh, so no, I, I don't see that. 
But uh, uh, one thing I will say is, of course, there was early on a big emphasis in many of the camps on Americanization. And, 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 and uh, that was very important. Uh, uh, camps wanted to shape people not only as Jews, but to show how Judaism and Americanism are perfectly compatible. Uh, uh, so yes, that did play a role. So there's a question about gender division in some of the summer camps, you know, it was you know, a boys camp and a girls camp, separate camps, and even within the one camp, separate activities. Um, obviously, I would not probably have seen that so much in some of the socialist camps that were trying to create a more egalitarian, certainly within the non-Orthodox, but what's, what's sort of the landscape of the changes and the experiences of the gender segregation? Well, yes, uh, th th there, there, th th both of that, both of those uh, uh, phenomena did occur. Uh, I think if you noticed uh, Camp uh, Sedgwin originally uh, in its early years had a uh, camp for girls and a camp for boys on the same property. Uh, and you did have some camps that, that had that. They, they were in the same, if you will, on the same property, but in different sections. And then that eventually evolved into you know, the girls camp and the boys camp, girls cabins and the boys cabins and so forth. Uh, uh, so uh, yes, both, both existed. And uh, um, it, then there were, there were also some camps that were just for uh, boys early on and, uh, and just for girls. Um, uh, then eventually, you know, they, they might uh, partner up, but uh, uh, no, all of that did exist. Uh, but I would say that from the 1930s, 40s on, they, they would be what we would call co-ed camps. Beautiful, and there's a number of questions about, um, Inclusion as a major focus today of camps. Uh, racial diversity was one of the questions asked. And I would just say in terms of helping to reshape how we think about our community, I know in our reform movement, uh, we actually were able to welcome the first transgender camper uh, that was really a, a real stretching of the entire community in terms of the parents and the camp staff. And it actually preceded our movement's affirmation of transgender inclusion in every part. So in that sense, the camp was the, um, the harbinger of where the movement would go. And it was an experiment that took place. They were also seeing more diversity in terms of, you know, Jews of color at camp and, you know, to just celebrate the diversity. And camp has an easier time, as you've described in those beautiful historical anecdotes, of being a place where we could experiment. We could, we could test some of those uh, people with disabilities. These, these are huge um, parts now of contemporary camping. And even the, the sort of the specialty camp, you know, the camp that's about sports, Jewish and sports, Jewish and science and technology, Jewish and arts, that, you know, to really also address the current spiritual and actual marketplace, People like more specialized things where they could grow their Jewish understanding, but also some of the other uh, things that their children are embracing and, and learning from. So we're, we're actually seeing, I think, a very fluid, exciting um, renewal, reimagination, and camps not just doing it the way they've done it for a century, but charting new territory. Do we see some things? I know it's not history until it's yesterday, but just what do we see in terms of some of the more recent trends that you've been able to, to see well, and notice? Well, one thing following up on what you said, Rabbi, is that <clears throat> uh, the making our camps available, you were talking about, for example, uh, some of the contemporary opening up and inclusive efforts, but uh, the uh, 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 making our camps available to uh, those who are physically challenged, people in wheelchairs or have other physical disabilities, uh, uh, parallels the awareness that was beginning to grow in uh, American society when buildings and uh, structures needed to, uh, by law, needed to begin to make them make uh, 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 various places more accessible to people who had disabilities. And uh, camps were one of the earliest places where this was making young people who 
who had these disabilities, uh, giving them the opportunity to participate in camps. Uh, this begins already 20 years ago, maybe even a little earlier than that. Uh, and uh, I also want to add something. This might be as what my my kids would refer to as, as a random because it's 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 not connected to the question you were just asking me. But I, I I'd like to get it in that I I know that in our liberal camps, both in the conservative and in the reform movement, I can't speak more broadly than that. I I I'm, but we should I point out that the refugee rabbis from Germany played a leading role in shaping the camping movements in the conservative and in the reform movement, uh, not exclusively, but a leading role. And I believe that the reason for that was uh, that back when they were raised in Europe, uh, they were exposed to all sorts of youth organizations, Zionist groups, uh, and and uh, and that that experienced these kinds of group activities, and that enabled them to see the importance. So back, for example, on in the West Coast, uh, Rabbi Wolf, and the camps connected to uh, Rabbi Alfred Wolf, and the camps connected to the Wilshire Boulevard Temple, or Rabbi Wally Kelter, uh, Alehem Hashalom. Uh, 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 that you you can speak to the role they played in camping in uh, the Midwest. Uh, Rabbi uh, Shalman, Rabbi Lorge, uh, Rabbi Weiner. Uh, 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 these were all uh, immigrants, uh, either coming before the Holocaust as refugees, or even some who came after. And the the leading role that they played should not be forgotten. They shaped. Uh, these camps in a significant way. Uh, uh, Dr. Plout, Dr. Plout uh, as well. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you for that random. It really, it helped all of us. Um, I wanna also just say as Jewish educators and as rabbis and as people who care about the Jewish future, we know many things have been tried to inculcate more Jewish connection, particularly among the next generation. And some of them are effective, whether it be religious school, day schools, um, you know, youth groups, all those things. We did a very serious uh, study of our alumni, and it turns out that immersive summer camp experiences is the most impactful thing we can do to give a Jewish spark and Jewish skills and Jewish uh, yearning to the next generation. We found the following, 82% of our alumni participate actively in synagogue, a Havara, or a minion. 89% of our alumni give their children a Jewish education. So again, we think of as a Jewish community, what are the places where we should invest in? Now here's the hardest statistic. You said, I think accurately, there are probably about 80,000 uh, kids at Jewish overnight camp. We in the reform movement have 15 overnight camps. We have about 10,000 uh, campers and staff right now in camp. But the scary thing is that as impactful as it is, only 10% of the young people who are eligible to go to Jewish overnight camp experiencing that. Now, again, some of it is not uh, just financial. We, I think all of the camps do a lot of work around scholarships. There are a lot of other competing types of camps and experiences. But if we know this experience is so unbelievably impactful, wouldn't we want to create a Jewish community that had the opportunity for every single Jewish young person to experience overnight camp? That might be the most effective thing we could do as a Jewish community. And there are a number of questions in terms of inculcating a love for Israel, a love for the Hebrew language, the Yiddish language, these are accomplished so powerfully in our overnight camps. But I think our, our only sadness on a day of celebrating all of this amazing impact is that it's still a fairly narrow slice of our community. And again, to even you know, share out with the many people on the webinar today, how do we advocate for more? Uh, more opportunities, uh, more, again, could we create more camps? The answer is yes, we've added to ours 
Um, I, I, I'm sure the history would tell us about the expansion of the wide camping network, but the power is clear. No demographer, no Jewish educational you know, uh, professional would deny that. Uh, and can we get more? Again, the people who've, got, who've gone have been impacted and carry that everywhere in Jewish life. Uh, but the question is, can we do more? Um, and I think maybe that's you know, one of our last questions to just kind of close on and spe specifically thinking about this summer with COVID, you know, having to test our campers. And I know people say, well, aren't everyone who walks into camp this summer vaccinated? Well, the answer is we've got kids. Come on, we can't have, you know, eight-year-olds are not being vaccinated. So we have created, as have all of the camps, the JCC camps, the Ramah, the NCSY, all the Orthodox camps, we've created in the private camps a safe way to be at camp. We've adapted to something that's been so unbelievably devastating, but we've done it. So kind of like a, a looking forward question, uh, my beloved colleague, you know, uh, you were shaped by your experiences at us, really. I was shaped. Uh, we're just going to know that 500 plus people on the, in the chat have said their own stories are being impacted. We are not doubting that. But what, what's, what's ahead, if you can, or what would you want to be ahead for us? I want, I, 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 I'll, I'll uh, try my best, and I'd love to hear your, your final thoughts on that as well. But, you know, the one, uh, another important factor that you, uh, you know, you, you, you didn't yet mention, but I know is on your mind is, that the whole uh, uh, panoply of Jewish leadership has been transformed by camping. Uh, this is where mess a significant numbers of future rabbis, cantors, Jewish educators, leaders of Jewish communities are, uh, ever since uh, the post-World War II period, the camping movement has produced that. So it's not only uh, 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 these people that we're talking about, but it's also leading the, the future. I'll tell you what my answer would be. Uh, I think when you look at the early pioneers of educational camping, I'm just going to confine myself to people like Benderly, people like Schoolman, people uh, 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 of, the, of, of, the, of that ilk. These people were fanatics about their mission. They believed deeply in their mission with a passion and they acted on it. And I think that that is really what we need to do. We need to, uh, those of us uh, who are today the beneficiaries uh, of uh, the camping uh, movement, uh, we need to continue to pay it forward with more vigor and more commitment. I think we all felt, Rabbi, didn't we, what, what we lost last summer. In so many ways, we felt, we realized what we lost. And now that uh, we, we're, we, we, we've got the privilege of having a second chance, we, we have to, we have to uh, do more. Thank God, uh, we, like you said, we have uh, many, many uh, people who are investing in camping and making it possible for young people to go. Uh, uh, we have a foundation for Jewish camping, which is doing good work for all of our camps, and that needs to be mentioned. Uh, a wonderful uh, innovation that's, I think, now 20 or 25 years old. Uh, but we have to do more. We have to expand. We just as we want to send our young people to uh, to spend time in Israel, we need to send more and more to camping. It's going to take the work of our rabbis, the work of our leaders, the work of organizations. They, there should be competitions between all of our uh, of our communities to see who can send the most to camp and get to a point where we have to open more camps. Uh, that would be my wish. Uh, but I'd love to hear you finish us off. Well, it's, it's beautiful. I say amen to all of your hopes for the, the Jewish future and for the camping having a central role in that. I, I would just say, I know we're going to conclude in a moment. Um, just to say uh, amen to the Foundation for Jewish Camp, which has professionalized, brought resources to all of our Jewish camps, as has J Camp 180 with Harold Grinspoon's phenomenal work. We've raised the bar. The, the camping that was done sort of, you know, on the fly is now a deeply professionalized, very thoughtful resources created. You know, Tisha B'Av is going to be next week. We've got beautiful resources being created and shared across 
the whole system. We are doing things to really think more systemically, more strategically, but I will just end by saying it's about the magic. It's about the spark. It's about the joy and the delight in being Jewish uh, and the creating of a real community. For those weeks, we experienced something so unbelievably powerful that many of us have said we can't imagine our lives without it. Let it grow and prosper. Let it deepen and expand and let each of the souls at camp, and by the way, it's not just the campers, it's also the staff, they are worth investing in. Uh, we thank all of you. I'm gonna turn it over to Ari Goldstein from the museum for uh, his great work in bringing us together. Thank you so much, uh, Ari, please. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Gary. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. There's a lot more to this discussion, but I'm really grateful that we were able to uh, present a little bit of it today, sort of Jewish Summer Camping 101. We did record today's discussion and we'll send a link to everyone via email tomorrow, along with some suggested resources on the topic, including uh, Gary's anthology, but also uh, Hebrew Infusion, a book that just came out, and, and there's a bunch of other resources which we'll uh, collect and share. So, uh, as well as some highlights of uh, images of Jewish summer camps from our collection here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and links to explore the American Jewish Archive Collection. Uh, I must mention that everything we do here at the museum is made possible through donor support. So thank you to those of you here who are our supporters. And if you're not, we hope you'll consider it. Uh, many Jewish summer camps are nonprofits made possible through donor support as well. So if you, if you feel so compelled, please support the, the summer camp that means something to you and your community. We wish everyone a terrific summer, a great time at camp. If you or your kids or grandkids are there now, and uh, we thank you for tuning in.